The following is a conversation I recorded a few weeks back with my friend Chris Mormon. Chris and I didn't actually know each other until a couple of years ago when we both started working with 888. And I had to admit that I had a preconceived idea of how he was as a person before I even got to know him. I had this idea that he was sort of arrogant and, and quiet because that's how I perceived him at the table. And I realized now that it was mostly based on or solely based on his playing style and not actually accurate at all. Once I got to know Chris, I realized that he's one of the most humble people I've ever met. And he has this incredible story with a lot of ups and downs throughout his now 15 year long career. And I was excited and honored when he agreed to come on the channel and share some of these stories. I can relate to a lot of the things that Chris has been through. So my ambition with this podcast is to share some of these stories, highlight the mistakes that we both made, and hopefully prevent other players from making the same mistakes. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and enjoy this 90 minute conversation I had with Chris. Chris, how's it going, man? Yeah, good, man. How's it going? Uh, it feels like a long time since we've uh, hung out. No, I'm on a I'm on a 72 hour self self ban imposed after a bad Sunday. So yeah, that's a long <laughs> 72 time. 72 hours self ban. <laughs> I didn't know there was such thing. No, I mean I just made it up myself. I'm like I'm not I'm not even loading up a lobby for 72 hours just trying to like, <laughs> not think in... about poker. But instead, I'm on a poker podcast. So you know, I'm, I'm... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get away. Got to compensate somehow. Yeah. Um, okay, so you had a bad one. Yeah, you know, uh, that's the way it goes, happens. But uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of live poker coming up. So I'm going to be going uh, in Vegas for a bunch of live tournaments. Win The Win's got a big series coming up. They're running that 10K, 10 million again. And a mystery bounty, that was fun. Uh, my wife, Katie, went deep in the last one and pulled a huge bounty. So Oh, yeah. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's a fun tournament. So. How much How much did she pocket? Uh, she got like a 50K bounty. It was then it was 1,600 buy-in. So uh, maybe, it was 25, maybe it was a 2K, 2,200 buy-in. But yeah, it was funny because I was on the golf course at the time because I I didn't make it through today too. But she had, I think she was second in chips out of maybe 500 players left. And she had 200 big blinds and no one else on her table had 40 big, more than 40 big blinds. So she literally just played any two cards and just called people's all in for you know, peeps and just kept getting there. And uh, so on the first break, so she'd been playing two hours of live poker and she managed to knock out nine people in the first two hours in live poker. I mean, I don't know how many hands you can get dealt in two hours of live poker, you know, and then you've got to win them and knock them out. So yeah, it was pretty cool. So just, I sweated on FaceTime at the golf course. So <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, congrats, by the way, to the ACR deal, but you and Katie, your wife. Yeah, that's pretty cool, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. How's it been so far? Um, yeah, pretty good. I think we joined like in the middle of the World Series. So I've been there a few months now, sort of getting settled in and stuff. And uh, everyone's, uh, yeah, like everyone on the team and uh, already done some sort of cool things, promotions and stuff. So, And even now they're like trying to expand. Um, so they're trying to expand in the UK and Europe. So trying to get some new tournaments on there earlier and a little bit faster structures so that you know you're not playing all week and stuff like that so it's nice that they're sort of listening and uh taking on board and you know like i had a call with someone and uh then the tournaments were in the lobby two days later so it's always nice when you know you feel like you're being listened to this yeah yeah no that's great uh i was just about to say that if you want my advice on how to grow the player prize pools and uh, <laughs> capture some of that european market you definitely want to alter your structures a little <laughs> bit and uh, either shorten day ones, especially yeah. for like the Venom ones and the awesome and all of those big series. It's just way too late. It's just unplayable over here, unfortunately. Like, I would love to play the Venom, but I I don't have it in me anymore. Yeah, anymore it's hard, stay not, up it's till hard 7 not to till it off, for sure. You know, it's hard at the best of times when it's that long time. But if you're playing in Europe and it's like 7 a.m. and, you know, some guy free bets you for the third time in a row, it's, it's tough to fold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it almost feels like a win-win at that point uh when, yeah yeah, yeah. if i lose i go to bed if i double up then obviously i got big stacks so yeah you're not really hanging around with 25 big players i get it no exactly and it's like that in live poker as well sometimes i feel like um quite often there's like a, a bubble of some sort either you have other plans or your friends are going out or you're you know you have tickets to some event yeah no, I had it the World Series, which I um, like did best in. I think it was 2011. I just 
literally never done anything in the World Series before at that point. It's sort of been coming four or five years straight, a few min caches. And then one year I stayed, um, I was staying in a house with friends, but I didn't realize how far away it was from the strip until I, you know, paid for it and booked it all. So we were like 45 minutes away from the strip and I don't drive as well. So it was there. Uh, and I think it was back in the day when they didn't even have Uber. So I was getting a taxi, had to wait for the taxi to come every time it was such a sort of ball ache. And I finally get to the Rio. Every time I was short set, I was like, okay, I can't bus because I've got to get home. It's going to take so long. So uh, I don't know. I seem to, maybe I played a little bit better subconsciously. I was a bit more patient and uh, yeah, it went really well that summer. So I don't know, something to be said, but something to be said for just sort of hanging around in tournaments and waiting, waiting, and, you know? Yeah. I can relate to that because I don't drive either. And back in the day, I used to rent a house with, with my friends and uh, most of the decent houses in Vegas, they're about, at least uh, I would say 20 minute drive from the Rio. Like there was nothing really close by that you would want to stay in for that amount of time. So we always ended up staying about 15, 20 minute drive from the Rio. And yeah, back before Uber was around, it was, uh, you had to rely either on your friends driving you every time, which could have been quite stressful if you had a day two or, or whatnot, or you had to rely on the local cab drivers, which, may or may <laughs> yeah. not show up um, yeah it was like 50 50 for sure yeah no but it's weird how like it's, I, I find it funny how few poke drivers uh poke players actually drive you know like a lot of my friends especially from the uk lots lots of people just don't drive and i feel like in regular life if you find people in their 30s pretty much everyone drives you know like i'm actually i'm actually supposed to be learning to drive this year except now what well, it's february 21st and i still not booked a lesson so you know, i told myself okay i'm finally gonna learn to drive but yeah i just haven't, haven't got around to it i'm thinking i was holding out to self-automated cars but now it seems <laughs> like <laughs> we might might be a few years away and i might need a, a license before that so i might just bite the bullet and get automated automated license uh not do the manual bit because i think that one's a lot easier and i don't think the manual is that useful anymore uh since right yeah what, i mean 80, I just, I, 90 percent of cars are automated yeah we just got a tesla so it has the self-drive function on it but it's only really good for the like uh like the motorway or the freeway kind of thing like um if you go on regular streets it can mess up and I, i've heard some things as well like if, if it crashes when you've got self-drive on you can get sued and stuff so it's pretty not <laughs> not the best idea to be used yeah you still need you still need a license to drive those yeah yeah you, yeah i'm saying yeah, <laughs> you can't just sit in it yeah 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 we're a few few years away um so i wanted to talk to you well first of all i wanted to ask you how do you study to get better at poker because obviously the game's changed a lot in the last couple of years and yeah. it's not what it once was uh it's now a lot more competitive than when we used to battle in the 100 rebuy on stars uh, and it was a global market and all that good stuff nowadays you're pretty much have to at least if you want to play online poker i would say you're pretty uh, it's an obligation to dedicate a lot of time to studying and, and following the trends and keeping up with the latest softwares and all that sort of stuff so i'm curious to hear how you study to get better because obviously there's not um there's not just one method there's a lot of different ways you can study like you can watch i, I have some friends who are watching replays of final tables and they try to see what all the best players are doing because nowadays they're so easy to get coverage from all these final tables and there's commentary and uh, explanations to each play so you can really get a good insight in how the, the elite players players think about the game. But I'm curious to hear how you study poker. Are you using a lot of the solvers or are you watching a lot of the replays? Are you talking poker with friends or a little bit of all of the above? Um, I'd say a little bit of all of the above. I, I find that I'm the, the study I most enjoy is kind of watching the final tables, you know, even just watching... Uh, say like the 10k super millions final table like even having a bit just to make it a bit more fun maybe betting on a player so you've got an interest as well and then watching you know obviously they're playing for high stakes they're going to be playing their best or trying to um so watching and then sort of if you see something that you wouldn't have done yourself sort of then 
going sort of investigating that spot in a solver or stuff like that. So I'll, I'll use solvers. Like if I have a hand, if I played a hand live and I wanted to know if I sort of did a good job on what I could have picked different sides in and stuff like that. So I'll run the hand back. Um, but I maybe not, wouldn't sort of say, okay, I'm going to sit down for two hours with a solver. I'll just kind of run some hands through it. It wouldn't be sort of my main focus, but I'd like, obviously kind of like, you need to know what people are doing, like what the general strategy is. So I wouldn't say I'm trying to play GTO. I'm just sort of um, knowing what that is and sort of maybe making some exploits. And uh, I think final tables, what just watching a lot of final tables is good. It's almost like, practicing the, them being there yourself because that's obviously where all the big money is and uh you can see you, you can notice when certain people are uh, maybe playing too tight like too icm aware like uh, you can take it too far and uh um sort of over bluffing in spots where people aren't going to play back even though they kind of know you're sort of full of it and just different different spots like that you know like um how you can um go after the chip leader in a way in certain spots if you know when they're open in a wide range it's a pr pretty good way to chip up um uh, by free betting non all in for example off like 25 big blinds just because um it's still going to be a big hit to them if they shove and they're wrong and people tend to like give you a lot of credit there and you know you're up against the wide range to, to begin with so you're unlucky for them to even find a hand that they can sort of contemplate um continuing it so yeah just um i like to sort of spend uh a lot of time uh um, finding stuff to do on the final table because uh, that's where I think you know you get different player types and uh, you can take advantage of uh, people maybe being too sort of I feel like a lot you know like back in the day everyone would play for the win and it's almost gone full circle where um, people are trying to ladder up a lot so you can I think you can uh, definitely abuse that in certain situations yeah I 100% agree I think ICM is one of those things that People either play, uh, take it way too far, like you say, they they respect ICM so much that they just stop playing and they become so ICM aware that they're justifying folding in every single spot. Uh, and then there's some guys that are completely neglected. And um, I think both of us are somewhere in the middle. I think before, like, before I started studying ICM and even knew kind of what it was, it was actually to my benefit because I really didn't care and I couldn't understand why people were playing so tight yeah. once you got yeah. to the final table. So I was just going for it in every spot and just playing ship EV like all the way through. And, uh, you know, luckily it worked out because I, I ran pretty hot, but still like looking back at it now, it's like some of the calls I made at the final table would just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just calling off the half your stack, hoping to be flipping. Yeah, I just... Oh, yeah. Pocket fires, I'll call it off it. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. I remember, I remember like calling deuces and shit and like, oh, this guy definitely has two overcards. I'm just going to take a flip here and then just being right and, you know, it working out or whatever. But yeah, people, I think people definitely take ICM too far in the sense of sometimes they, like from the big blind, they'll they were like, oh, I can't reshove because I'm risking, you know, if I get called, I'd be out. Whereas actually a lot of the time it's better to rejam than uh, to defend from the big blind because, you know, you just you sort of blind down and, you, you you know, a lot of the time it's hard to get to showdown. You have to make, you know, your opponent can put a lot of pressure in you on the final table. It's hard to bluff catch uh, when you know, you're facing big ladders. So it's, you know, especially against wide ranges and with no one else behind you. So you can't even run into a hand. You can rejam at, at in certain spots. You could actually rejam like close to any two cards. Obviously you wouldn't really want to do that, but yeah, it's kind of crazy that um, people adjust. And uh, another example, say someone's sitting with five big blinds and uh, they fold in the hand, it folds to you blind on blind. You've got like 10 bigs, obviously you're short as well. People will just walk the big blind with, really pretty strong hands just because they're like, oh, I need to wait for this guy with five big blinds to blast when in reality, you know, you shove, you're going to get folds most of the time. And then even if you do get caught, you've, you've still got a pretty good hands. So you can, you know, you can double up and obviously double up's huge. So yeah, I think people over adjust uh, in, a, in a lot of different ways in ICM. So it's interesting. It's uh, quite a good thing when you start final table to sort of note down how you think, how you predict people maybe going to play from how you've played against them so far. And then, um, obviously your thoughts and opinions can change as the, the final table develops. You know, some some players just open four hands in a row. It's, you know, even if you haven't seen a showdown, you start to think, okay, they're, they're, you know, they're now going for it and stuff like that. So 
you just have to sort of pay close attention and uh, just be willing to adjust pretty quickly. Yeah, I feel ICM is a lot about adjustment. Well, tournament poker in general is a lot about adjusting to the situation and making these assumptions. Yeah, it's kind of the beauty of the game for me. Like it's, you know, just how much poker's changed over time and it's still fresh. It's obviously not as fresh as when you first started playing, but still, you know, you're trying new stuff and uh, new. Yeah, it's not just like repeating the same level of a, a computer game over and over again. It kind of gets boring. It's like, you know, it's like say like they released the sequel and now you've got to try and conquer this one. So that's kind of the excitement of poker to me. It's not really, especially tournaments, it's not the same game ever twice. So you're sort of, you know, sometimes you can have a more skilled final table, but actually the less skilled final table might be tougher because your your player is a bit more unpredictable and you don't know how they're going to react to what you're doing. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, this feels, feels kind of like poker 2.0 that we're entering in now, like with the solvers and, and everything and how fast players are adapting to it and developing their games. Like the, the level of play these days is insanely high compared to... 10 years ago where no one really had a clue, like even the best players in the world were just playing on intuition and experience. And, uh, you know, it worked because everyone else had absolutely no clue on how to play. But uh, nowadays, even some of the the weaker players in the pool really have a, a good understanding because there's just so many resources now to get better. And also just playing versus so many good players all the time, you can catch up if you pay somewhat of attention, you're going to see what they're doing and you're going to realize, okay, this is actually how you should be playing and, and you're just going to adapt that to your own game. Yeah, I mean, if you if you get, as long as you're not really stubborn, if as long as you're willing to sort of work and change your game, don't think you've got it all solved. Poker's like, with the amount of information that's out there, it's obviously a lot harder game than it was back in the day, but it's also a lot easier to, to get better at it. You know, back in the day, say you had a big stack in a tournament with, two tables left, you know, you'd expect to close it out a really high percentage of the time. Like even top three, you're like, you know, as long as you didn't take a really bad beat, you felt like you're guaranteed. You just raise a lot, everyone fold a lot or just different, different things. Um, you could just abuse your opponents, but now, you know, people are fighting back and uh, it's a lot, it's a lot harder and you have to stay more in line and uh, just pick your spots a bit better. But it's definitely a spot where you're not like, okay, I've got this locked up, you know? Yeah, that's a big difference, I think. Uh, back in the day, like you said, you could almost expect a certain result depending on your stack, whereas now it's more about you have to sort of rely on the cards and, and you just have to not make any mistakes. Yeah. Because if you make mistakes, then you know your opponents are automatically profiting on your behalf. So you really have to keep mistakes at a minimum and just try to play as optimally as possible, but then also find these exploits that you've developed over the years and see trends and, and little subtle signs here and there where you can gain an extra advantage. Yeah. It's a lot smaller edges. And, you know, sometimes, you know, say the cards aren't going your way for a certain amount of time. You're like, Oh, um, you know, am I sort of getting killed in these games? Or it's like, whereas back in the days, be like, if you had a bad, you know, say you ran bad for a day. I remember playing sessions sort of back in like 2008 and nine and, my problem was I, I could never take any time off just because the game was almost too easy. Like, you know, even if I had a bad day, I'd break even. And so when you never lose, it's tough to sort of take a day off and justify and be like, okay, I should hang out with friends, whatever. And now, you know, you, you have a bad day, you can, you can get killed kind of thing. And you have to sort of a lot, um, I think a lot more emphasis on the, the mental game. Like you have to be able to deal with those bad days and come back the next day and uh, play your best still and not, not, make big errors and you know because when you do get a shot you need to not blow it because you know you don't know when the next one's going to come sort of thing it's not like you're playing back in the day you play i know you might play like 20 tournaments and you feel like you're going to go deep in like four or five of them whereas now you you know you need a lot more things to go your way kind of thing yeah absolutely um speaking of uh, mental game how much are you working on your mental game and like preparation before each tournament or is it anything you do in breaks or how you changed your approach over the years? Um, so I like started working with a mental coach kind of, a, I, I guess it was kind of before everyone started doing it, maybe not like there was obviously people doing it before me, but um, I started working with a mental coach in like 2000, end of 2013, I'd say uh, at the time 
I basically had to drop all of my horses. Um, I was back in about, at one point I was back in 30 players on my own. So I was bankrolling them all myself and the swings were kind of crazy. And I also was very unorganized. I <laughs> can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was in my twenties, I was unorganized. I was still trying to play like six days a week, myself poker and deal with 20, 30 players as well. Talking to all of them, send them money, like collect money, lose money, get some money stolen, whatever, et cetera. Uh, build up big makeups, uh, chase losses. Yeah. It's kind of very DJ and, made a lot of bad decisions like the best decision I could have made was to get assistant straight away but I'm I don't know if I was trying to be tight and save save a few few, few bob or not but uh I tried to do it all myself and uh, for a while it actually worked out okay but that was mainly because the games so soft back then um I was fortunate and unfortunate in the sense of one of my first horses ever um within a few months of playing for me got second in the PCA for like nearly two million dollars so obviously I'm I got half of that plus the makeup, so probably about 60% of it. So I just got drunk and made a million dollars watching the final table. So after that, everyone knew it as well. So everyone just hit me up on Facebook, MSN, all of that, and uh, asked me to back them. And at first, I watched their hand histories and like went through it. And, and then by the, after a while, I was just like, yeah, sure, I'll just put you in some mid-stakes. And then obviously mid-stakes changed into bigger stakes, especially when uh, Four Tilt did all the multi-entry tournaments as well where you could play each tournament up six times that was kind of the death of me when I was they had like a big 1k running and uh I remember you could play up to six times and so I was trying to put basically I had horses in different tiers so I'd be like oh my elite horses they could play I said no one could play six times because I was like I needed to sort of uh <laughs> cut the exposure in the that's tournament. enough so I, yeah yeah so I said I, okay. uh, I said four was the max I think and I, I even said myself, I'm only gonna play four because, like, obviously I couldn't play six. If my guys, yeah, set a good so, example. So, yeah, some of them also I thought maybe you know at the time at that point were better than me or whatever. So I was like, oh, if I'm playing four, they can't play. Yeah, so I got can't play six. So okay, so I played four, and then some of them just played one. But you know, someone who had big makeup gets knocked out early, and they're one bullet, and then they're like, can I play another one. I was like, okay, you know. Or if I said no, they say, oh, come on, please, and then I'll be like. Okay, so I couldn't say no twice for it. So then those guys are in for a couple of bullets instead of, and then actually that one I got, you know, I got, I remember actually I got my first four, I got knocked out and I um, was like, fuck it. So I put in my, <laughs> I put in two more and I hope no one saw, but I was there. <laughs> and actually that the sixth one I actually ended up final tabling, but um, with two tables left, because I, I remember I was playing in England then as well. So it was really late at night. And with two tables left, I had three horses still in. But I was in this tournament maybe for probably, I would guess, around 130K that I put into this tournament. And uh, with two tables left, there's three of my horses still in and I was still in. So it was looking good. Uh, but then all three of the horses busted out before the final table. So I'm like, I'm trying to control my own emotions as well, not tilt. And then uh, full tilt crashed. So I was just waiting around for an hour. Didn't know if it's going to come back or not. And back then as well, everyone sort of knew each other. Um, so we were all talking on AOL Messenger, like, oh, what should we, what should we do? Whatever. It crashed for everyone, the whole site. Yeah, crashed. it crashed for everyone. So it wasn't just me. But then it came back and I ended up, but on that final table, I remember that was one of the first times maybe I was thinking about ICM because uh, um, I was like, oh, I need to get cash for 130K here. So I'm looking at the payouts and I, I worked out what the horses are cash for. And I just wanted to finish in profit. So I ended up coming third and uh, it was my biggest score online at the time, I think, I think like 200 and something. So I was like, okay, I made profit at the tournament. But yeah, that was kind of how it sort of went for a while. Like the swings were crazy. And uh, then I think it was the 2012 World Series. Uh, I I just had uh, Mosin, like he was Mosin Chernia, he was playing for me and he just um, won EPT Monte Carlo for like a lot. And he sent me all the money on PokerStars, which was obviously was kind of bad for me because this, the uh, scoop just came up and I had people in like 300, 400K makeup. And uh, I tried to basically take a quick shot and get them out of it and put them in some like 5K small field tournaments, hoping they'd win. But yeah, they didn't. And so I remember by the last day of scoop, um, I tried to send some money. Obviously, everyone's trying to get money for that Sunday, huge Sunday. And as I sent someone some money, it just came up. You've hit your transfer limits for the month of a million dollars so basically Mosin had sent me all that money into my account and i'd just been transferring it left right and center to all these guys and you know you, not got that much you back. transfer your horses a million dollars combined in one month yeah and wow. i probably got maybe like 100k back so 
And then the World Series was happening, you know, and obviously the World Series is huge as well. And they're all like, what are we doing for the World Series? And I'm like, okay, guess I'm going all in. So I like, it's like emptying out the bank account and uh, <laughs> getting all the dollars together and putting everyone in that in the main event. And uh, I remember that main event actually cashed, which is pretty rare for me in the main event. Uh, I think it was my maybe my first cash of the main event at the time as well, like my sixth attempt. And me and this one guy was still in with like, 200 left and but i was thinking it was so much pressure because i was like oh if, if neither of us does good then i kind of gone all in on this tournament i don't really have anything left to show for anything and obviously i've been doing well at poker myself but it just i kind of degened it all the way and i felt like it's like i just had my dad's voice in the back of mind saying oh you should have bought a house or something you know like <laughs> stuff like that but i'd at the time i didn't know where i wanted to live and also i wanted i felt like okay i didn't have the time to invest into the stock market i didn't know enough about it and uh, so I thought, yeah, poker, I know what I'm doing with that. And for a while it was going well, but then, you know, once it went bad, it went bad real fast. And I sort of started chasing losses and, you know, didn't, I didn't really have the, um, what's the word? I, like if someone was in a lot of makeup and they weren't playing very well, you know, because it's, I mean, it, a lot of the time they're not going to be at that point when they, you know, every day they can't even make money themselves. It's hard for them to sort of play their A game and, you know, they got in makeup for a reason in the first place. Sure, they could have been running bad, but also they were probably making some mistakes along the way. So once they got, you know, 300, 400K in makeup, most of the time, 99% of the time, I'd say, like, unless you're playing, like, super high stakes and you know, so not that many buy-ins, you know, if you're getting, doing that in online poker, um, it's very unlikely you're going to get out of it. It's just going to get worse. And I had friends who would cut their horses when they're in a, and take the losses, but... I never really had it in me to do that. And it just resulted in bigger losses, basically. So yeah, that World Series, I, I didn't win the main event, spoiler. And uh, I had to basically start all over. And uh, that's kind of when I got into the mind coach kind of uh, side of things. Because after that, um, I just met my wife, Katie, as well. So we went and um, sort of lived in Vancouver for a bit to play online. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to grind it back, play lower stakes. It'll be fun uh, when every dollar is meaningful again. And it actually wasn't that much fun because the game had started to get tougher. Like I was thinking, oh, if I just go down to these like $20 tournaments, I'm just going to crush them. But, you know, I forgot in these $20 tournaments, there's 5,000 people in them. Uh, you yeah, know, you come, you come, massive. Yeah, you come 15th and it's like very painful. It takes a lot of time and it's like... And, you know, also you have that a little bit of an entitlement factor after you've done well for a long time. And you, I didn't play any live poker for like a year and I was obviously seeing all these big events going on and I wasn't in them. So I was getting a bit of FOMO about that. And you see other people who you think are, you're better than winning tournaments. And I was kind of becoming bitter. Basically, I just didn't like the person I was becoming. And Katie actually told me, she was like, um, hear me out kind of thing. She knows like UK people as well. They don't, you know, they're not big self-help. They just, uh they figure it out on their own kind of kind of thing. So she was like, uh, why don't you go and see this guy? He's been working with, um, I think he was working with uh, Liv Burry at the time. And, and uh, she was like, oh yeah, and Liv's been working with him and uh, she's cashed her last, last four 10Ks. And I was like, oh, four tournaments. <laughs> yeah. Must mean, be so great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He must be, you know, he must be doing, yeah, he must be the best ever. So anyway, uh, this guy actually, uh, he flew to Vancouver from the UK uh, he had a friend who was going to see as well, but he also like uh, sort of Googled me and thought like he could work with me and stuff. And uh, I agreed to meet with him, but I went in there very skeptical and sort of, I'll just do this to appease her kind of thing. And I had my first meeting, came back and she was like, how'd it go? I was like, actually pretty good. And I went back the next day and it was crazy because I was able to sort of open up to him about everything, really poker, life, all the stuff I've been through, even stuff as like a kid and stuff like that. And I instantly felt like I'd known this guy for years. And like, you know, sometimes it's, you can only, it's hard to talk to your friends really. And like, maybe you talk to them about personal stuff only when you're really drunk and then, you, you know, you don't remember it. So yeah, I opened up to him about a bunch of stuff and I started, you know, I went on a nice little upswing online and started to feel like I was coming back a bit and felt a bit more positive about things. And then I, like a few months after working with him, I uh, went and played at WPT in LA and I, I, you know, it was 10K and at the time I still wasn't like, probably back on my feet. So I sold like 50% of it and just was like, okay, I'm excited to play though because I hadn't played a live tournament for a while. And, you know, just kept coming back day after day and uh, six days later, I ended up winning it. Like I ran really good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 
but it definitely helped having even when you have those especially in a six-day tournament you're going to have ups and downs and i sort of had this guy's voice in the back of my head and like you know even in the past i might have been like because i was chip leader say with four left and then suddenly i was four out four and past me might have been like oh i've blown this and uh definitely a part of me still was like that but i also was like okay well try to look at the positive like whatever happens this is a great great result and uh you know, I can start sort of moving back up and like feeling good about things. And then, yeah, the rest sort of history and I ended up winning it. And uh, yeah, even though I've not needed to talk to him as much as back then, I, you know, would have a lot more regular calls, but now I just sort of check in every, every month or so, like depending on what's going on in life and poker. And I talked to him about life and poker and, uh, or I always like maybe have a bit more regular calls during the world series, just because obviously that's such a grind and uh, um, you need to, try and stay fresh as long as possible. And uh, yeah, it's just worked with him ever since. So what, it's like sort of seven, seven years now. So, so kind of crazy because before that I sort of would never even think to talk to someone like that. And I wouldn't have, you know, someone, one of my friends told me that I'd sort of scoff at them and like, oh, yeah. can't figure out yourself. Kind but of thing. when your but, wife or now wife, yeah, uh, back then yeah. she was a girlfriend, when she tells you, then, you know, you listen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was also new to relationships back then as well. So yeah, I was, uh, yeah. No, but you, you were probably also in a very dark place. Uh, it sounds like, oh, yeah, how you could you not yeah, be, you, you go you from having, it. thinking yeah. 2 million to being broke basically, and have to start all over again. Not many people would have come back from that like period. So if someone's handing you some sort of branch at that point, and, and you can just take a leap and, and see what happens, then, you know, you'd be wise to do so because you have to change something because otherwise it's going to end up in the same situation again. And it seems like this guy, I don't know what, what his name was, but uh, it seems like he really saved you, man. Yeah. Steven Simpson. I give him a shout out, but Steven yeah. Simpson, yeah. Shout yeah, out to yeah. Steven. Yeah. He's, he's, he was, yeah, he was really good at what he does, you know? And uh, yeah, it's one of those things when you're at, outside of the situation you are of course yeah it's obviously really how did you manage to deal with that but at the time i was like in my head i was like oh come on you just gotta like you just gotta stop sulking you know i was like when really obviously <laughs> anyone would sulk in that situation because it's like kind of i felt you know i kind of fucked up and uh it wasn't even like i lost the money myself really obviously you know you have little downswings but it wasn't like i'd gambled it all myself so the fact that i other people lost it for me felt worse and I felt kind of stupid and uh yeah you know you know you just it just you know you obviously you know people say oh you still you had you got achievements and I'm like yeah well if you still just feel kind of dumb for like risking it all and and it, I don't know it was one of those things where I had to do it and I don't regret it but yeah looking back at it, it was pretty <laughs> pretty degenerate and I'm, I'm I'm one of the least degenerate people actually there are. Like I don't sports bet and I don't play like casino games ever. But yeah, I thought I had an edge and I thought, yeah, I thought, yeah, I was getting, you know, the problem was is basically I won a million dollars straight away without him doing anything. So I was kind of fish hooked in and I didn't see like all the downsides, the negative things going to happen, like stealing or people just losing. I just... And the game was so easy back then as well. And the games obviously started getting harder and uh, I didn't have enough time to sort of do work with everyone. So there was a lot of things I changed, uh, but overall it was still a positive experience. I met a lot of people through it. And I also think it helped develop my game because I was talking to a lot of different styles of players and I tried to implement different stuff that I thought was good from each each of them. And I also would watch um, just a lot of final tables that I didn't have a vested interest in just um, to sort of learn what, more what the population were doing so i could sort of try and coach some of the horses and stuff like that so yeah i think it helped me overall but it was yeah it's definitely ups and downs i can relate to a lot of the things you just mentioned i mean not to the same scale obviously like i haven't invested all my winnings in in my horses and then lost it all and had to start it over uh it hasn't gone that far but i had about five horses i think at most at one point so I know what it means to um, have a stable of, of other players, managing them, making sure that they're playing what you want them to play, making sure that they're playing well, that they care, that they're professional, 
and also playing yourself and dedicating time to studying and, and coaching and uh, you know it's 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 a big it's a big task and it's not easy when you don't have any sort of experience you, you kind of have to figure out how to be how to run this small operation yourself like i said like i didn't have an assistant either i think that would have been very smart to do you should probably if you're going to back more than three players or even three i think it would make a lot of sense to have an assistant you want a coach uh you want hire people to handle all these things so you don't have to worry about it especially if you're playing yourself uh because playing yourself is stressful enough so when you're also monitoring and, and managing five other players at the same time that are playing the same tournaments as you are and then you know you end up at the same table and it's a, this weird dynamic where you know and they feel like you're watching them and, and they don't feel relaxed of how they play and when they make their decisions they're just waiting for that message to like oh i don't like that play and then you get into an yeah. argument and the discussion and you disagree like naturally you're going to disagree on a lot of spots like you and i would disagree on a lot of hands as well it's just natural a bit when there's financial interest involved it suddenly changes and it becomes almost personal in a sense and it's very hard to distinguish and keep it professional and not damage the relationship because usually you end up backing your friends right like people right, you yeah. trust people you want to see succeed and that's why you're putting the money behind them um at least that's been the reasoning for my decisions over the years with who I choose to back I choose to back my my closest friends and sometimes it worked out but usually it didn't and uh yeah it can be a very very stressful journey so I can only imagine what you went through when you had 30 horses at once and played yeah. that, that kind of volume and seeing the money it's disappear and um yeah it's it's not fun man yeah, I, I mean, I also like, you, you know, you might think it's in your best interest to sort of cut a horse and you think he's not playing it well anymore. And it's like, I know you're good friends and you know that this is basically the last chance or in poker and that, you know, you know a lot about them. You know that, say, I don't know, they don't have any, you know, good education or anything. So if, if poker doesn't work out for them, they'd sort of have to start all over in sort of some kind of bad job or whatever, you know. And, you know, it's like a whole lifestyle change for them if you, and it's, you you know you justified yourself like oh you know they could get lucky or like they could, they're gonna they'll improve or you know you just you don't want to be that guy when you can you can make it work and you can sort of get around it but you like cutting them off like you need to be ruthless to be a good backer and it's, it's tough sometimes when you get emotions involved yeah i i definitely waited too long uh but it at that point it, it was kind of a mutual decision on on both parts yeah um because it's it's tricky uh, because there's a lot of things going on, right? You don't want to disappoint your friend. Like, that's why you're backing them in the first place. You want to give them an opportunity to do well. You want to see them succeed. Secondly, you also want to see you succeed in the sense that you've put all this investment, all this time, all this, this money and resources into this player. This player is now in makeup which will be gone if you quit you'll never have an op opportunity to get that money back that's just how makeup deals work yeah. and uh, if you decide to quit and pull the plug then that money just disappears uh so that's another thing as well at least for me i don't like the feeling of like giving up or failing um i'm always like trying to hold on like i see the same tendencies like in crypto now, like I bought some shit coins like back in 2017, all my friends sold in like 20, 2018, 2019. I'm still holding on to these shit coins because I just don't <laughs> want to give them up. <laughs> They're not worth it. They might come back. Yeah. They might come back. Yeah. I, I believe, you know, like you never know. Um, so I see some sort of similar trend and patterns there and the way I approach things and it's probably something that I, you know, I need to work on. I need to learn when to cut your losses and when it's when the EV is simply higher to just start over and, and just give up. Uh, you yeah, know, it's I think it stems. One. Yeah, I think it stems a little bit. I have like a fear of missing out sometimes. Like I, 
you know, say even if nothing's going on, I don't like to go to bed until everyone else has gone to bed. You know, something might something happen or kind of thing. And I remember getting rid of one of my horses. So like they were just playing bad. It was a good decision. They were in a lot of makeup and they definitely wouldn't have got out playing for me. They it's like almost like say like a football player when he's just playing bad for a team and he you know changes club and then suddenly he, he finds his form and he's play he's in like a new player kind of thing. Anyway, I dropped this guy and then he like satellites into a W Coop event um that he and then wins that W Coop event, okay, for like AEK. Nice, congrats. Uh, it's like friends of the guy, so I'm like happy for him anyway. Um, but then anyway, after that, he decides to take a shot in W Coop main event, and then he chops the W Coop main event for like 600K, and he had like 500K makeup for me. So I'm just, in my then in my head, I'm like, oh, I would have got all of it, you know? But obviously, if I put him in the W Coop main event, it would you know, he wouldn't have had the confidence winning the, you know, it's just like obviously the butterfly. The butterfly effect. effect. Yeah, exactly, so... But part of you is like, oh, God, if I had just kept him, who knows what could happen. But, you know, the likelihood is he would just kept losing. He would have owed me a million instead of 600K or whatever, you know. So it's the way it goes. But obviously, you, I do definitely have a little bit of that missing out. And, you know, like, say you, you don't go and play a live tournament. Obviously, you can't win if you don't go and play it. But, you know, if you think, oh, what if I'd gone? You know, I could have won and stuff like that. So I'm watching the updates and I'm like, oh, maybe I should have gone. But. Yeah, what well, was I just feeling lazy stuff like that? So I definitely have a little bit of that, a little bit of that in me. Yeah, uh, it's it's so hard to know. You know, you never want to sell. You never yeah. want to sell at the bottom. Uh, you always want to sell at the top. But like realistically, you're never going to end a DL with a horse that just being the tournament eater. So like you always, you're always going to end uh, somewhere. You know, in the middle, uh, ideally. Um, I think that's better than obviously ending at the, the bottom, but it's really hard with timing in any any sort of industry or market, like whether you're investing in the stock market or in crypto, it's almost impossible to time the high and, and to get out at the absolute top. So you're always going to have to accept some sort of loss, I think. But realizing these little patterns and signs and, and being confident enough to actually pull the plug when it feels right. I think it's something that's a key, uh, just to limit losses as well. And then look at other investment opportunities. Yeah. I mean, like similar, like say you're like the best sports people in the world, you know, very few of them just retire on the top. They go on, you know, like boxers go on too long. They, they love it too much. They, they think they can still do it. And then they, you know, it takes a, big knockout or something and then they like can't come back from that and sort of not destroy their legacy but like you know it's, it's a sick thing if you're undefeated but you you know if you got if you're undefeated and you got 48 wins why not try and get to 50 you know it's kind of there's double-edged sword you want to keep going but obviously time and you, you can't keep going forever so yeah yeah it's, yeah it's basically impossible in anything really to get out on the top just because of human nature you always think you can keep going or do better you know well, normally, I mean, normal people <laughs> that has regular jobs, they're usually retire when they're 65-ish. Uh, but I think in poker and, I mean, more so in sports, I guess, um, it's almost impossible to to know when the top is. I mean, look at Tom yeah. Brady, he just retired at the, uh, you know, basically at the top, like sure, they didn't win the Super Bowl this year. But um, he felt that now was the time and and, you know, before I heard earlier in the season, I heard him. He was gonna. He said that he was gonna play till he was like almost fifty. Um, but then I guess he changed his mind, maybe because how things were going. But I sort of respect. I mean, I don't. That I don't yeah, I don't know much about NFL, but I just like heard a few people saying that he might come back. Like you know, like people they retire and they come back. Like that's the they new were just thing. Yeah. That, yeah, next year they were saying that um, basically part of his reason for retirement um, was that he didn't really have the team behind him to um to win so like why so maybe he'll come back with a different team in a few in the next the season after or something but yeah who, who knows i mean I shouldn't really talk about something i don't know anything about but yeah that, that's interesting it's almost like uh there's a clause in business um with bankruptcy so you can bankrupt a company and then basically start over and it's just a way to clear your balance sheet and like current debts right change the name yeah yeah uh it's a <laughs> you know it's like a legal way to do things but seems a little bit sketch uh to say the least uh, but speaking of backing there's obviously other forms of backing deals as well um make up 
you know, used to be the number one and most common form, uh, which I think we can both agree, probably not the optimal one, at least for the backer. Right. Given that all the money that the horse loses, it's just gone if the deal ends. Uh, but I've, uh, I've had a couple of horses that have had a different deal where I lent them the money up front for every tournament. And then I essentially bought 50% of their action at face value. Okay. Whatever they lose, they're essentially borrowing 50% of that amount, which they can repay at any point in the future at zero interest. So I think that's a pretty fair structure, at least better structure than the traditional makeup deal, uh, where the backer actually has the potential to get some sort of return. And every buy is essentially a new transaction. A new transaction, exactly. So there's no like long-term commitment. Like if the horse wants to quit tomorrow, that's perfectly fine. If the backer wants to end the deal tomorrow, that's also fine. That's a, a different way to structure it. But there's also, you know, you can essentially buy action on for every tournament. Let's say you pay 10 or 20% markup. You've basically free rolled the horse to so he has 10 or 20 percent of every tournament he plays. And then that's it. You know, there's no longevity there. There's no uh, uh what yeah. if what if this happens? Like everyone knows, everyone's on the same terms. And uh, if you Establish that your horse has, you know, 30, 40, 50% ROI in a tournament, then you'd be happy to pay 1.2 markup. So it's, I think that's a pretty fair deal. And there's no real question marks or like concerns there. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, my, my back in days are well and truly over. Like I don't even, <laughs> I barely buy, you know, like people selling. I don't, I've never, it's weird. I've never, I've never really been that interested in buying pieces of a particular tournament someone like i'll swap obviously but uh yeah i was just hooked on the whole i don't know maybe i just wanted to own own people or something <laughs> own horses. <laughs> i don't know but yeah now i'm like well and truly out back and i stay well away i don't, I don't you know obviously i miss it at certain points but uh yeah i'm sort of i'm retired from backing for sure yeah me too um it's a way t- different feeling uh backing people like you say or buying a piece when you buy a piece there's no there's no real like commitment or relationship there. It's just a transaction. Yeah. But when you're backing it, you're essentially my employee. Like you work for me now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, for better or worse. So uh, yeah, being a backer, it's like you're the CEO, you're the CFO, you're the HR, you're all these things in one person. So I think it makes a lot of sense if you're going to back people to hire other people to help you manage yeah, the whole operation like especially the amount of money you know you're you're investing in like then playing tournaments and uh like paying a bit a little bit extra on the side for people to do help with not do it for you it's just yeah it was definitely the probably the worst decision i, I didn't do you know because like at the time i'm like oh i can just do it myself and then uh i don't need to pay out this extra money for like a coach i can coach them and uh, there's just not enough hours in the day you know you can't you can't do everything you need to sleep and do, do other stuff apart from focus sometimes. Yeah, and also just the, what we were talking about, like focusing on your own game. How are you going to have time and energy to that and headspace if you're also going to manage and, and oversee this whole operation? Yeah, I mean, I had I had once, I remember I was like final table, the four tilt Sunday brawl back sort of when it was like at its peak kind of tournament. And uh, I came back from one big blind on the final table to win it. So obviously that should be like, an amazing feeling which it was but so i cashed i think i won it for like 100k or so and it was yeah it was great but then at the end of the day i was still down money on the day so I, that's when i was like starting to question some of my decisions i was like i just had an amazing day and i just lost money like so it, yeah it definitely can just take over like and then you you know you start to make bad plays yourself because you're like well it doesn't really matter like if i win all this day it's more about the, the 20 other people playing for me so it's definitely hard to sort of play your best and focus and put enough time into it so i felt when i did stop back and people i definitely felt like uh an improvement in my game as well like in the pretty quickly because it felt a lot more significant and uh i knew that if i won money that i wouldn't just have to send it out to someone else you know i wasn't sending 5k here and there and i could actually like use that <laughs> that 20k or whatever a cash flow would last a bit longer 
Yeah, I definitely felt the exact same feeling when I started to scale down my horses as well. Like I could just focus on on myself. I didn't have to manage people anymore and I didn't have to worry about all these other things. Uh, so I could just completely zone in and, and focus on myself and my own game and playing my best and doing everything I should have done, uh, you know, to begin with. What sort of advice would you give to someone? Because obviously a poker has changed a lot in the last years, uh, especially since we started playing back in 2008, uh, at least for me. I think, I believe you started playing around the same time. We were battling a lot online. Yeah, I was like 2006, but I played cash to start with, I think. So yeah, I probably was playing tournaments like 2007 or so, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, we we encountered each other around the same time when poker was... Uh, on yeah, it took, me, it took me about six months to work out that your screen name was your name back then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but finally a, got it one day, I was like, oh, that's close. It's a tough one to crack, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it took me a while to... <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what are the one thing that you would advise, give advice for someone who's trying to improve in today's standard and trying to take their game to the next level? Um, I guess like outside help, maybe, you know, cause it's hard to identify like in anything, like, you know, you, you play golf or something, it's hard to sort of know where you're going wrong. Like if you get, a, if you go and get some lessons, you get a coach, like you save yourself a hell of a lot of time, you know, it might cost a bit more money to begin with, but it's going to sort of, help you in the long run you know uh similar with poker you know you might be like oh this person charges quite a lot for an hourly um rate is it worth it but if you think about it like if they just help you in a couple of spots in tournaments that money comes back pretty quick so it's worth investing in someone who knows the game sort of inside out and uh can quickly identify what your biggest weaknesses are and uh go from there kind of thing and uh then get you thinking about the game in a different way and then from there you can you know, there's lots of material out there. You can watch, I don't know, you can watch certain people on Twitch who are like, know what they're doing. Someone like Ape Stars, obviously, being at the top of online poker for a long time. He streams, he streams like a lot, a lot of sessions you get to see his thought process cards and stuff like that. So that information's all out there for free. You know, you can obviously you can sign up to a training site. There's lots of different ways. Like back in the day, it was a lot more you learned from trying things out but now i think you can learn more off the table and then implement so you can come in with like a strategy and then implement it a bit like how you sort of did for your final table you know like for the main event where you sort of ran a simulation a bunch of times and then you sort of came in feeling prepared like if you if you know what to do in a lot of situations you feel comfortable the more basically the more decisions that feel comfortable for you at the poker table that are like easy straightforward for you um gives you when you do get a tough decision you can you've got more sort of brain power to f- focus and come to the right conclusion in that in that sort of moment uh exactly so really uh seeing what the best players in the world are doing i think it's really key because you can get so much insight today by watching these final tables and seeing what they're doing and then question always stay curious and question why they're doing certain things and then try it out yourself and see how it works i think coaching yeah. is super underrated yeah. as well yeah when i would watch because like i was saying i would watch final tales back in there and obviously you wouldn't even see the whole cards only only it's showdown you know so you wait around for one hand in 20 or whatever that got to showdown now you get to see every card from every player you know you get to see the cards people are folding as well which often gives you a lot more insight even than the cards they show down you know you see oh wow this guy's folding pocket fours in early position off a, off 20 big blinds oh i would have just raised you know it's tough to get a, it's tough to get a pair in poker you know so you'd be like oh well, i'll just raise see what happens so, so it's interesting you get to see the different sort of hand selections they pick at different stack sizes and you can just learn infinite amount in a short space of time just watching uh, these final table replays especially with like top players who all know what they're doing yeah, I one thing I like to do is uh, I like to pause the video. Uh, Predict what will happen. Yeah, exactly. So once the the whole cards are out, I right. see what everyone yeah. has, and then I pause the video and I I predict who's going to open, who's going to three bet, are they going to flat, and like how many ways to the flop. And then on the flop, I do the exact same thing. I pause. 
okay, what size is he going for here? Is he checking or betting? And how does he play? You know, and then I see if I'm right and if I or if I'm off. And then try to pick up patterns. It's like a simple quiz. Uh, yeah, and it's、game. also like when you're in that situation yourself. If you're getting, you know, a lot of these、uh, predictions right, then you, it helps you to sort of range your opponents when they do the same thing. You you think, okay, this is what they do with X amount of hands. So you get to, so you know, say the board runs out particularly bad for them. Then and、mm-hmm. even if you don't maybe have the sort of most intuitive bluff combo, you can be still like, well. I might go for it here. Yeah, sure. I'm over bluffing if I use this hand, but they're just going to, on this particular run out with the hands that they get, they're just going to find a really hard time to call here, kind of thing. So just different things like that. Yeah, and every now and then you see something completely nuts, and yeah, and yeah. You check the <laughs> you comment section it, and、yeah. like, is, is anyone else seeing this? And like, is this, <laughs> <laughs> is this normal?、Uh, and then you can, you know, go in the lab and, and look at the spot and see if.、Uh, If if it's actually a, a thing or or not, or you bring up a discussion with your friends and see what they think about that spot, and、uh, that's the beauty of the game. I feel like, is even though so much material out there and, and so many resources to get better, it's still a lot of unknown spots. It's such a complex game that it's like never, it's never going to be completely solved, in my opinion.、Uh, at least we're very far away. But how do、yeah. you see how do you see poker going? Like let's. We could fast forward like ten years from now, so like kind of similar, almost as long as、uh, we've been playing for. How do you think poker is gonna be played in like twenty thirty, let's say, or twenty thirty five? Yeah, I mean, it's,、uh, it's hard to say on- online. Like, I think live, it won't actually be that much different because I think live, you just get a lot more people who are stubborn and they don't want to get better. They think they're. They've got it all solved. They, you know, they won a tournament before, and they've just been running bad ever since. You know, you get like because life's a lot slower pace. I think it's harder to work out when you're sort of getting killed in the game. Like online, you find out pretty quick if your account runs out of money. You know, so you're like either you reload it and like okay, I'm going to change something, maybe get coach or put more work in, or you you quit and you go and do something else. So online, I think yeah, it could be like crazy different. Whereas I think on、uh, live will be. Pretty similar,、um, but yeah, it's hard to say which direction it's going to go. Like, I don't know if it's going to. Also, the technology you're going to—is everyone going to be like there in person at the table, kind of like with webcams? I don't, I don't know. Like,、um, so many, yeah, so many questions that、I've、poker on、answers. the blockchain. I think poker on the blockchain. I think is inevitable.、Uh, yeah, in the near future, I think ten years from now, that's that's going to be the main platform for it. Yeah. No, it'll be interesting to see because, like, I mean, it has changed the game. Like, the, the strategy has changed a lot, but I don't know if, like, still the format's not changed that much. Like, in the sort of, you know, obviously you had different styles of tournaments. Like back in the day, it was all about like the hundred dollar rebuy and stuff like that, and now you have, you know, progressive KOs kind of took over. So you have had some changes in that respect, but the biggest change really has been、uh, the players' approach.、Uh, To the game, so I, I like. I wonder if like the, the poker sites, obviously,、uh, they're always trying new things. And、uh, but yeah, I wonder if there'll be a real sh- shift, or it'll be pretty similar still in the, the tournaments and stuff it offered. But、uh, yeah, no doubt the game online will change a ton as well. Yeah, and、uh, you know it's it's crazy because you see back when I first started playing as well, like a lot of the top players then, you know, don't even play poker anymore. They sort of For different reasons, maybe they stopped enjoying it. Maybe they were, you know, went on a losing streak, couldn't get out of it, or yeah, just various reasons don't play anymore. And、uh, your that will obviously continue to happen. Like even now, you'll see some of the top players just kind of lose it, or just lose the passion, or want to do something else. Like it's hard to stay in poker really, like、uh, for a long time,、uh, just for a variety of reasons. Really, like it's hard to stay. Um, winning for a start, and then it's also hard to stay motivated and、uh, fulfilled as well. So it's yeah, it's definitely difficult. Where's where's your level of motivation right now? Like at this stage in your career, do you still have、um, the hunger to to grind as as you did back in the day, or have you seen it shift、uh, in recent years? Or how is it? How does it compare to、uh, previous in your career? 
Um, yeah, I think it's definitely not as high as it once was, you know, like when you're new to the game as well. And then also when you're young, you, you don't, you know, for a while I was playing poker six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. That's all I was doing. Uh, kind of took over my life and not in a good way, really. But like I was doing well, making a lot of money, but I also wasn't happy doing that really. But I kind of just immersed myself in poker at the time to sort of uh, void face and why I was unhappy, if that makes sense. And now I definitely have more balanced lifestyle. But with that, you also, uh, you know, sometimes I'm like, I, I definitely could be better at poker than if I, if I put more into it. Like I still put a lot into it, but uh, like more than the average person. But I know myself, you know, compared to myself back in the day, I, I'm definitely not putting as much work in in terms of time. And uh, it's not the be all one end all for me, even though when, you know, say if I go on a losing stretch, then that's normally the time when I'll actually work extra hard. It's like you go on a, a downswing that you, you put the, the work in to, to get out of it, but you know, you should be putting that work in even when it's going well. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely hard to stay a hundred, you know, like back in when I first started playing every day, I'd be excited to get up and play. And now it's more like, Oh, if there's a big tournament or a big Sunday and like still every Sunday for me, I enjoy it. And I, I'm like, like when I wake up like super early or whatever to play, I'm excited to play. Um, but yeah, the regular sort of weekdays, not so much. And uh, I'd rather, you know, sometimes I end up playing if I don't have plans, but then that doesn't normally go that well because I wasn't sort of looking to play in the first place. So I feel like I need, now I need to be excited for the day, like excited for the live tournament uh, to go there. Rather, if I just feel like I have, I should go because it's a good tournament then I sort of go through the motions and uh, don't put 110% in. And then most of the time, you know, you're not going to get the results you want when you do that. I mean, obviously still you can get lucky. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in, in today's <laughs> but, day and age, like you really have to be a hundred percent like to even have a chance. Um, yeah. The, that was more a thing in the past. I feel like you could kind of half ass it and, and, and autopilot a few times and still do decent at least. Uh, uh, but nowadays, like edges are so so small that you really have to put all your effort in. I think to to even have a chance. Yeah, you can't be distracted by other things going on, like on your phone and like all the time, or like surfing in there. Nah, like those <laughs> those days are over. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, watching a TV show. Yeah, yeah. But I remember even back in the day, like yeah, I I was you know very fortunate early on in my career. I had a lot of final tables on the the EPT, uh, and then back like. In like 2011, 2012, uh, around that time, I started bringing out the iPad to the table and I started, you know, scrolling and, and, and you know, watching movies and, and, you know, listening to podcasts and all that stuff. And I just, you know, I'm just going to play tight, you know, like, and I just abandoned everything that actually gave me success, uh, which was yeah. like using my intuition and having good table presence and all that stuff. I just took that for granted and I completely neglected that that's that was those was those were actually my strengths. Otherwise, I was just, you know, relying on the cards and I was playing way too tight and just like waiting for hands, basically. And, yeah, I mean, then, if, you, if, you, if you've got someone on your table playing on an iPad, it's not really going to intimidate you, is it? <laughs> you know, you're like, <laughs> no. you're like, oh, I don't want to raise this guy's big blanks. He's, he's, yeah, you, know, you, so you love like, to see it. Yeah, exactly. you love to sit down and then have a guy pull out his ipad and then the headphones and staring down and watching uh, the new uh, bond or whatever yeah if you got someone staring you down level one of the tournament live you're like oh shit this guy this guy means business he's gonna yeah fight it's taking it seriously yeah yeah but it's easy to do it's like once you have success it's hard to like stay you know obviously when you don't have it you crave for it and then when you get there it's kind of a bit like now what kind of thing so then you almost you feel like you have to play certain times because you feel bad if you don't play and then you know but then if you do you you're probably not going to play your best anyway if you don't 100 percent want to be there so it's, oftentimes if i'll if i'm playing live i know that i don't maybe have the focus to play right from the start and play all day and play well so I'll tell myself, okay, I'll do something in the morning that I want to do and I'll come to the tournament a bit late. Sure, I'm going to miss out on some value from some of the weaker players. And yeah, I could have had a bigger stack. But also, if, if it doesn't go my way and I'm there from the start and I'm sort of 
looking at everyone else staring at Chip MV and I'm sort of like, why am I losing to these players? Whatever. The, lots of thoughts can go through your head when you have time at the table. That's playing live. There's so much downtime. Uh, I know that I'm not going to be playing my best. So when I tr- maybe I'll come like a few hours late and then I'll be like, okay, I'm going to be here a lot less time. So I sh- sh- should avoid being on my phone. I should pay attention and give 100% when I'm there. And it's better for me than being there more time and just uh, sort of going through the motions. That's kind of the way I approach it, even though I know, you know, you're giving up some value from the, uh, some dead money that might have busted and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's kind of the way I do it. Otherwise, I think I would, live poker especially, it's not some, I, I obviously, like, there's no better feeling really than going deep in a live tournament. But, you know, a lot of tournament poker is, um, you, don't, you know, you don't cash, you don't go deep in the tournament. So when you're doing that live, takes so long it's quite draining so i find that uh i prefer to sort of play for less time but when i play um put put everything i have into it kind of thing and then i'm actually sort of excited and happy to be there and then obviously once you're on day two and in the money in lifetime and then obviously the game completely changes but i try and minimize that uh day one aspect even though that might cut into your roi or whatever but uh it also makes what about uh, late ragging? Right. Are, are, you, are you doing a lot of late ragging, especially during the WSOP? Because that's something that I've been experimenting with over the years as well. Uh, finding the motivation of when to show up and when, how to approach things so I'm fresh in yeah. case I go deep and I, 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 I um, save some energy for the rest of the series. Because if you show up on time, obviously that's... If you're a profitable player, then that's the highest EV to show up on time every tournament you play, uh, because you just, you're making money like from level one. But obviously, when the blinds are, when it's really deep and blinds are tiny compared to the stacks, and and each blind isn't actually worth that much, you're, you know, there's a balance point there where there's a, a threshold where it actually makes more sense to late drag and. and if you can perform better once you reach a deeper stage of the tournament or especially during the WSOP where you're playing 30 or 40 events in an eight-week span, uh, you really have to save some of that energy for later on. And that could actually end up being higher EV, even though you're sacrificing some early EV by showing up late. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to know yourself as well. So I know by now I've, I've played it enough times that, um, that if I show up on time every day, then I'm just going to be over it pretty soon unless you have a result real quick, which is unlikely. So, like, I mean, I remember this year, though, like um, I was waiting for sort of the vaccine to come through so I could play. And the first event I was eligible to play was the 1500 six max. Like I love six max tournaments. It's obviously a fun one to play. So I was like, okay, I got there on time. The music's going off. I'm like, okay, I've arrived at the world series. I'm a week late, but you know, nothing's really, I haven't missed anything that good really. I go in there, lost every hand. Uh, we even played the wrong blind level. Like the dealer didn't realize for the first. So we were playing hundred, 200 instead of, uh, 100 100 so basically all the pots were double so i lost every hand and so i lost double the amount of chips i should have and then we rewound the blinds so i finally like i got a message off a friend or whatever saying uh this hand history and i was like wait the blinds are... he was like oh you're playing the wrong blinds so anyway we rewound the blinds we played the old level for the last five minutes of the level and i won the three hands in a row and i won nothing basically so i'm fuming already i get knocked out of the tournament it's a re-entry so i rebuy get knocked again and i'm out and so then i'm off to the next you know, I'm off to the win or the Venetian or whatever for the next tournament and bust that. And I've done like five bullets day one and stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I can't keep doing this. So like, sure. You know, I could have, I ran bad. I could have, maybe I didn't play well, whatever. But from there I realized kind of, yeah, I liked, what I like to do is sort of go down, look at when, you know, I will still want to come in with like 50 bigs or something, something playable. So I'm not just sitting there like, hoping to find a hand, but also um, where the blinds are big enough where you win a big a pot, it feels relevant. And then I'll be like, okay, I want to play for two hours before dinner or something. So, okay, I've got two hours. I can put 100% focus in for those two hours. Then I go off, have the dinner break with some friends, catch up with them. Uh, and then there's only four, you know, four hours left in the day, two hours to the next break. So it's like breaks up the day a bit more and then you're like, willing to come you know if it doesn't go well which is not going to most of the time you're just like, okay i come back the next day and in the morning maybe i'll you know 
go to the gym or play pickleball with friends or something you know do something active so your whole day isn't poker because like i find when if i play poker all day and it doesn't go well then i kind of like annoyed that that's like a waste of a day like so at least if i've done something that i enjoy as or as something outside of poker that i enjoyed then uh can be like and then when you play poker it feels a bit more fun you're there you're like engaging chatting to the play, uh, other people at the table you're having fun you're learning about other people uh and the results obviously they matter still but um they're not quite as important like if you're there from the start you feel like all right i, I got to go deep in this one I'm, i've put you know put 100 focus in i didn't drink the night before like so i feel like and when you late register for me it's a lot easier to deal with it didn't work out like i'm like oh well of course it didn't work out you, you didn't get there on time anyway so you can, you don't feel like sorry for yourself when things don't you go your way so yeah i've done that for the last sort of, probably i don't know probably the last sort of 10 years and at, at first i thought it was just because because i was being lazy but then i sort of quickly worked out it's it's what works for me it's what i can maintain over like a month period of live poker because live poker for me online is something that i've always uh enjoyed no matter what really and live is very much a love-hate relationship that i i don't really like even back in the day i wouldn't even i'd go and play the ept main event but i wouldn't play all the side events i would just go there and play the main event and sort of hang out uh i, <laughs> I had a stupid theory that uh i had a set amount of live final tables that i would make in my career because i was i stuck to live focus i didn't want to waste one on an ept side event that no one would come right up so i was okay if i if i final table a live event I need to at least make it something that is like a big deal. So I didn't want to waste it playing. Like Where do you get that number from? I don't know. <laughs> I just thought it what would be was like, the number. Oh. It was real low because I was <laughs> at the time. It was like my first five years in live poker. I was uh, me and me and Sean Deeb used to joke that we were like the worst live poker players ever. We just went online and donated back live, and then kind of ironic that he's gone on to sort of crush the WSP, and I've like done a right overall, turned it around. But yeah for the first five years even my mum was like telling me you know i've watched late night poker on tv in the uk and they're all wearing sunglasses maybe you should try that so i mean i tried it once for day two of uh, like the five dime blazer like when they used to have that 25k i think it was and i remember like seeing my day two table draw and there was no one that i knew that well so i was like, okay i won't feel stupid with sunglasses on at the table so i did it and like first hand i had most standard open ever like on an ace five suit or whatever in early position it was one of those ones where i raised and everyone like had a little tank it felt like we're tanking but you know maybe they just hadn't even settled in their seat yet and everyone folded so i won the hand but I just felt so nervous. I hadn't even seen the flop yet. So I just, I took the sunglasses off and then never wore them again. But yeah, I don't know. For a while I was like, I don't know how to win at life poker. I was almost on the verge of giving up. And then uh, it was, yeah, 2011, my final table with the Aussie Millions right at the start of the year. And then uh, everything I played, I seemed to do go deep in. And then, you know, like obviously poker media always like, fishing for answers or whatever so they were like asking me so what have you changed how's your approach changed and you know i what did you say nothing really i just said i was you know i was winning the key flips or whatever and also you know when things are going well your confidence is obviously higher so maybe in certain spots uh, but this was before you started working with a coach yeah yeah this was just like back in the day when you were just you didn't even know what you're doing yourself you know <laughs> Uh, you just yeah, someone poker. asking you, uh, who, yeah. what, what, what are you doing? And you try and come up with some answer that doesn't sound really Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, like, I, I think my main thing was maybe being a little bit more patient because, you know, I, I came from an online background where you're playing lots of tables and I was maybe trying to win the tournament on day one live and uh, not changing gears and stuff like basic stuff like that. But I mean, a lot of it was just down to running better. You know, I'd, I'd had I'd had runs before that and, you know, just things didn't work out you lose a big hand and it's like the difference between you know getting top three and coming 20th so uh it was yeah i ran good and i was feeling good and confident but yeah yeah it's one of those weird things where it, when, when, when you're in that zone it feels easy you're like oh, how am i not going deep all the time before that but yeah when you're not in it it feels impossible you know so it can it doesn't matter who you are like the success you've had in you know i was doing really good online i could just never work it out live and it's the same game and i was like it was so frustrating because i'd also see these players who were like if they were playing online they would be like the worst player at the table and they were beating me and i couldn't work it out for life i mean it was really frustrating to the point where i almost stopped 
you know, I've, I'd only go to a live event if I satellite in because I, I, then I wasn't losing the money in the buying. So even though, yeah, so stupid stuff like that. So, but yeah, it's just weird how the game works like that. You know, you you could play your first live tournament and win it or whatever, and then you you think you're the best live player ever, and then you you know you brick for a few years and think you're running back. So it can go both ways. Yeah, and I think momentum matters a lot. Uh, I think we've seen that. 100%. Time and time again, players suddenly starting winning and then all of a sudden they, they're winning three tournaments in a row in like a six-month span or, or whatever. And uh, they just yeah, have to seems, be... Almost seems rigged, you know? <laughs> it's impossible to prove like the science behind it, uh, but there's clearly something there because there's been so many cases now of, of that happening you know, as Dan Smith winning three 5K tournaments in Monte Carlo in, in a week, three yeah. 5K tournaments, and each had like 200 players in them. And they weren't soft tournaments by any means. They were like pretty tough side events. That I think is one of the, the sickest achievements in poker, period. Like, because it was such a short time span. Yeah. And to win, not just final table or getting top three, to win. But then there's been lots of others as well, like... D. Peters, Bonomo, Federer, like there's been tons of players who've had a tremendous yeah. amount of success in a very, very short time frame. Even like when Dan Coleman and then he's and then he like um, you know, then he won like that seminal hard rock tournament with like thousands, you know, so it wasn't just small fields. He like just goes and plays the main event, and just wins that as well, like, like fifteen hundred runners or whatever it was. You know, what do you yeah. what do you think? What do you uh, attribute that to? Like uh, momentum, because it's such a like wishy washy like. Yeah, no, no, no. Okay. like what, what? But how can we explain it to someone who doesn't understand or doesn't believe in it? Because I, I know you believe in it as well. Uh, but like, how do we, how do we put it into words? I don't know. I'd say something like to the, to the fact of like, obviously in poker, there's a lot of times where, even you know, when you study the game, you know the game inside out. There's going to be hands where you're like not sure if you took the right line or. Uh, you made a good or bad play. So you'd ask your friends and, you know, you ask them on break and you're sort of like, you're stuck on a previous hand and you're still playing. Uh, so it kind of takes away some of your capabilities of like focusing on the future. Like, obviously you want to learn about it later on, but it's not a good time to sort of be stuck in the past at the t in the, when you're in the present. So I think when you do have that momentum, when you're, you know, you know, you're on a good run, you've, you know, you won your last tournament you played or whatever, you kind of, as long as you don't have the winner's tilt factor, like you start playing bad, but you have that, you're more at peace with yourself. You're like, okay, if I made a bad decision, it's it's fine. Like I, I am, you know, I didn't make many bad decisions in the last tournament. And like, you, you don't have that pressure of, uh, you know, knowing that you, you need to win soon or something. You, you just feel like you're almost free roll and you have fun with it. And like, yeah, you're just, you're just having fun. You're enjoying, you almost see spots that, um, I don't know. You like feel like you're outside the rim, kind of like you're 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 in the zone. You're kind of it's just all these things are aligning, and like when things go badly, you kind of laugh it off, you brush it off, you you're not dwelling on it, and you can just move on. And uh, you realize, okay, I'm still in the tournament, and you can come back, and just all those little factors adding up. Plus, obviously, you 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 know, you're good at the game anyway to begin with. That, that gives you the extra sort of 5%, 10%, which, you know, can go a long way when, you, you know, sometimes edges can be thin kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know, a combination of all those things, but still, you know, it still feels like it's crazy how much it, it does happen that way, you know, like it feels like it's rigged. You mentioned something interesting there, winner's tilt. Uh, to me, that sounds a lot like entitlement. Like we've seen... Tons of examples as well of players who've had a lot of success uh, running way above EV <laughs> and uh, just being on cloud nine and, and, and just taking for granted all the success they've just had and just assuming that it's going to continue. And when it doesn't, they go on, on winner's tilt or like some sort of entitlement tilt where they get furious that they get so unlucky they can't believe it, you know, because this hasn't happened in, in five months or whatever. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, I'm talking in more in a different way. I'm, I'm kind of using it as a, like when 
you just do ridiculous stuff that you wouldn't overconfidence do. yeah because you're like oh i can get this guy to fold everything yeah so you just like go all in for like four times the pot on the, the river like and you don't have any good cards in your hand or anything you're just like oh yeah it's like almost like an ego thing like I'm, I'm this good i can win every hand kind of like and you know like you start stop playing the game that got you there in the first place so you like get too much like confidence like so it can go that way but uh yeah, like I get, yeah, I get what you're saying as well. When you, if you win too early or you you win when you shouldn't, then you kind of uh, become very, yeah, bitter when it's not going your way. Mm. Yeah, it's easy easy to happen, you know, that you take it too far the other way and and you just start taking things for granted. And I think it could be extremely detrimental to to your own game. But I've also experienced what you said. Uh, the overconfidence and you know taking things too far i think every poker player who've had some sort of success throughout their career have been in the same situation where you've had a lot of success in a very short time you're overconfident and you're just trying to see how how far you can take it and and you just yeah. start either bluffing way too much or becoming way too sticky and never folding uh playing much way too many hands and uh, he, yeah, it usually doesn't work out. And what changed things for me was actually at a final table in Monte Carlo. Uh, it was a 5K six max where I came in as ship leader and I busted in sixth place. And this was really early in my career. I, it was in 2008, I believe. And uh, I'd just been steamrolling the whole tournament till that point. And then I went out basically bluffing it off, complete airball into quads. <laughs> to the guy who was second in chips and ended up shipping the tournament that was short after and busted right after that so incredibly disappointed but that's actually what made me realize back then that when you have success it's a lot about not overstepping it and not taking it too far you have to be able to pump the brakes after you get yourself in that spot where you have the ship lead like it doesn't mean that you should start running over the table like completely you know you still have to manage that so i think that can be yeah. very tricky when you don't have a lot of experience at least it was for me it took me a long time to actually overcome that and starting to realize that once i get a big stack it's a lot about monitoring that stack and then using it for good and not overdoing it right and you can also sometimes try and win win the tournament too quickly you know you get impatient like uh you know, often yeah, you have a dinner or something. Grind. Yeah, you want to grind people down. Like that's kind of the way to do it, rather than like risking it all. You know, like if if they call, then suddenly you you now you've gone from one out of six to five or six out of six. It's like you, often, most of the time, it's not right to do that to say. But yeah, like you can definitely sometimes it's like a weird feeling because you fight all the time to get to the final table, but then like you almost sometimes in the final table you don't enjoy it. Like. The, the pressure of it as well you kind of want to get it over with and like get it finished and not like mess it up but you can rush it and uh try and you know push push things too hard kind of thing i don't know if it's the same for you but for me every final table i feel very differently about uh, sometimes i'm more nervous of a, a yeah. hundred dollar online tournament than i am at a 5k main event live tournament or 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 10k online you know like it's very different like i'm not sure why that is like what the factors are that makes it so different but i just feel a different feeling every time i make a final table and or i'm in a, a particular spot yeah i think there's a variety of things like sometimes it could be your last table of the day kind of thing so you could be stuck a bunch and you're like okay i need to get in this place to get even or sometimes you could be on a final table where you think that you've got four or five weaker players so you're like oh it's like a weird balancing act you don't want to push it too hard because you're like okay these people are giving their money, their chips away but then you also have to still keep playing your game otherwise you know you're just gonna be waiting for a hand that might never come so and then sometimes you're on like a table where you're like wow this is like every, there's no weak spots in this final table everyone's kind of sick or like and you're like okay i just gotta go for it and like you don't feel any pressure and then other times you can be like oh yeah it's just like i get what you're saying for sure like it depends on the setting and um your mindset at the time as well and what you know what's been going on the rest of the day you know obviously obviously you want to try and approach uh like each final table like it's just the only thing you're doing but definitely what what else has happened before that has has an impact on things as well 
yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot of different factors going on uh, why that is, but I just find it so interesting. And obviously I'm always striving to get into the same mindset I was in when I won the main event, you know, I was completely in the zone. And uh, of course, it's easy to self defined, yeah. Yeah, it's it's you know the, the situation kind of kind of occurs by itself, just by with the magnitude of the tournament and realizing that you're never going to be in that spot again. So it's easy to motivate yourself to really give it your all, and like it's not like you're picking up yeah. your phone anytime soon or like thinking <laughs> about what to have for dinner, uh, where. In other tournaments that ha doesn't have the same level of significance, I find it sometimes tricky not to distract myself or, or to stay focused and to stay motivated and all these things. Yeah, it's like, say, you know, you find out the main event, obviously you're going to have people wishing you good luck, but it's almost to the point where you're not going to, obviously you're not going to be on your phone, but like say you find a table, like a medium sized event, people are going to be saying, oh, how's it going? And you you feel like you can multitask, but you know, definitely if you, if you do sort of get ahead of yourself as well, start thinking about, uh, you know, the, the, when you get down to three players, when there's still nine left, stuff like that, then, you know, it's not going to go well for you probably. So it's hard to like, obviously in the main event it's you know, you're, you're never going to be on your phone, but there's a line where it gets to a certain level to where you're still going to be engaging and not being focused on what you're, doing when you're playing for the most amount of money as well or at the end because you're like it doesn't matter how many you know say you've got 200 big blinds of 18 left you still haven't you haven't cashed out yet you know like sure you've got half the chips in play or whatever you, but you st stuff can happen and you can make mistakes if you're not uh, still focusing if you you know don't you don't want to get ahead of yourself kind of thing yeah that's kind of when you try to fast track things like you say i yeah. try to end the tournament there because you're in such a role and now you just want to ride a momentum to to victory whereas when you're short at least when i I'm, I play short stack poker i have a different mentality where i'm like trying to survive and i yeah. almost i find it almost easier to focus then because i know that every decision could, could be, be the awesome. last yeah. yeah so i i actually love like 20 25 30 <laughs> big blind poker uh with like 50 and 60 it's it's sort of like in the mid range where like you're a little bit comfortable and like, you know, stacks don't really matter as much as when you're down to 15 or 20 blinds and you really have to pick your spot really, really carefully. Yeah. Every play is in this crucial kind of thing. Yeah. All right, man. Expect to see you in Vegas for WSOP. Yeah. It'll be, he'll be here sooner than you know, it, you know? Yeah. But it'll, it'll be interesting. Like just knowing, you know, the, it's not the Rio and stuff. I mean, like even the last tournament I played there this summer, it's kind of a weird feeling, you know. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people hate on the Rio, but I'm I'm actually one of its few fans. I mean, for for example, I met I met my wife there. Uh, my dog's named Rio now. After uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was at the Rio de, de Janeiro. I was a bit both because yeah, because you have another dog. Uh, called london, london right. yeah right so it was like a double-edged sword it was like a city name and you know after all right as well so what's the next my, one I, I basically i don't know Flamingo. No, no there's two 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 dogs enough but it was kind of ironic because katie asked me like oh what do you think we should name the dog and i always thought you know she'd just name the dog whatever she wants to name the dog kind of thing and i'll just go along with it and i just jokingly said oh you could do it rio because it's like the city name as well and, and we met there kind of thing and i was just doing it like as a troll and uh, she loved it. So that was that. <laughs> <It's tough. laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. That's awesome. How uh, did you guys meet in a tournament? Uh, we at, just met, at the nightclub? Uh, no, a final table. Like um, of my friend, like I was back in that time, um, final table, something. We were, all, we were just all watching the Brits, getting drunk, watching. And she knew him as well. So she was there with her girlfriend. She was in town for something. Uh, like some business thing she was working on and uh, she went down to watch as well and obviously you know there's not many girls in poker so it was like uh, I was a group of like 20 like 30 year old guys like 10 of us just drinking and two girls so we just like went over and started chatting to them and they didn't they actually thought we were quite entertaining like I don't know how must must have been the accent you know <laughs> even though it were being like loud there's, and obnoxious yeah there's so, nothing like a British final table right I'll tell you that 
Exactly. Yeah. So you know, and then we did some shoe bombs, and the rest is history. Shoe bombs. <laughs> yeah. You invented a shoe bomb. I didn't invent it. Like one of my horses, I think, started it. It was one of their final tables where they just drunk out their shoe, and then it just. I don't know, caught on. And now they're even doing it in Formula One, you know? So, yeah, in the UFC. Yeah, they do it in the UFC yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I saw the guy do it. The Australian day. guy. Yeah, yeah. That's his whole gimmick. I thought he invented it. Now I'm disappointed. No, well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe wow. So it's been it. around for years. Yeah. We were doing it like 10 years ago. Wow. Maybe so, you invented it. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I don't think I can claim it. I'll give it to like one of my horses if they did it. But yeah. All right, Chris. Thank you very much for uh, getting on the show or the podcast or the YouTube channel or whatever this will transpire into. But it's been uh, great catching up with you and uh, getting your insight and your super interesting story. And I think it's a story that most players have never heard. I mean, I've heard about it because you've been telling me stuff over the years as we got to know each other and being 888 ambassadors. I feel... It's been toughing it up. I'm wanting to talk to you about on a, like a public forum like this because I've never listened to any of your interviews or anything where you've been open about backing and all the emotions that comes with that. And it's something that I share as well. Yeah, well, good to catch up, and it's uh, it's nice to get some insights from you know, uh, World Series Poker Main Event Champion. It's not like every day you get to speak to one of those. So yeah, sure. nice to actually hear some of your opinions about different stuff and. Uh, yeah, it's always good to hear different viewpoints. Uh, I've enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in Vegas, uh, hopefully. Hopefully at final table somewhere. I'll see you. I'll see you at the Bally's. <laughs> yeah, Can't it's going to be weird. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is going to be weird. But yeah, hopefully a new chapter and some good uh, the momentum. And Yeah, and you got good. one deal for you. If you make a final table, you you got to agree to do a shoe bomb. Even if you bluff it off in sixth place. Again. A final table, not a bracelet. Uh, just... If if yeah, I win a bracelet, you... I'll do one for sure. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, Deal. High standards, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deal. <laughs> All right, man. Take care. Thanks a lot. Soon. All the best. All right, bye. Bye.